بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم so uh, this session is about international finance and we are going to talk about things which are not usually said parents were actually uh, role of international finance assistance in Pakistan Dollar assistance, IMF, balance of payments, etc. I will cover them. But actually, I am not going to talk about directly about these things, but indirectly. Because there is a lot of background to cover before you can understand what these are. So I don't have enough time to do that. But uh, I have other lectures which you can watch out. So as I uh, said actually in the question and answer session, that we have a major dilemma. When we talk about these issues, then. should we treat the cancer or should we treat the symptoms? Mm -hmm. Now we can take the current system as given and say, okay, it's causing this problem and that problem, and how can we fix that? Or we can say the whole system needs to be changed, and that's definitely true, but it's a much more difficult job. Luckily, what we need to do is both. We need to work on solving the problems being created by the system. Also, we need to understand what the system is and why it is causing these problems and how it can be changed. That's a much more difficult job than accepting the whole system as given and then trying to fix. Then uh, the thing is like, you know, why is going on and you send in your Red Cross to take care of the uh, people who are uh, wounded and hurt. That's one, uh, that's the symptom. But then you are trying to know why, what is causing the war and how we can prevent war. That's treating uh, the cause. So we are going to work on the bigger issue at this time. But that means that we will not be able to discuss how to send in the Red Cross cuts, how to take care of the wounded. The so we go back to the origins of capitalism. How did this system come into being? So basically, it's a long story and I have told many, uh, many things about this in other lectures, but we can start with the industrial revolution. And what that did was it created the possibility of massive surplus production, much more than you need, lots of goods. Now, this possibility <coughs> led to change in all dimensions of human existence political, economic, social, ways of thinking, acting and being in the world. All this was changed by just this simple thing that you can produce a lot more than anybody can ever consume. So the basic question which had to be solved by the industrial society is what to do with this surplus? Uh, initially what was done was to use this for warfare. So, there were centuries of European warfare with each other. France, Germany, Spain, England, Portugal, they are always continuously fighting with each other for centuries. Uh, this warfare created what is known as the military revolution. The Europeans learned to fight better than anybody else on the planet. And they also acquired weaponry and stuff which uh, nobody else had, because they were not aware of this. At the same time, they had this uh, industrial revolution which created the ability to produce a lot of goods. So, in the 19th century, they found out that initially they sent uh, people around for um, trade with the rest of the world, but they found that Nobody is willing to trade because basically the traditional society values self-sufficiency. So, in self-sufficient society, you don't want value for it. You don't want the animal. And production and consumption is not the um, goal of life. These are things that you do on the side. Goal of life is something else. So, uh, the trading strategies did not work, but piracy, robbery, and conquest, that did work. So, what they did was, that instead of trading, they started to conquer the globe. They did 
so this conquest led to the breakdown of traditional society all over the world. It was the same, including European traditional society. All over the world, traditional societies had the similar values. All of them thought that self-sufficiency is a good thing. You should not rely on others for your food. Uh, very sensible. Uh, in all traditional societies, a single standard of living was valued. Some people used to live very luxuriously, <coughs> but it was not considered something admirable. Nobody thought that this was something good thing that we should live in luxury. And uh, the society as a whole tried simple living. living. Excess wealth was bad, wasteful and ostentatious consumption was bad. The, there was the concept of community that we are all in this together. We should <coughs> help each other. There was the concept of social responsibility. Property was a trust that uh, it belongs to me temporarily, I should use it wisely, I have to respect the rights of others. Well, and generally, social obligation overrode individualism. Right? What I do for myself, or uh, selfishness is not good, and in if uh, my personal needs and the social needs are in conflict, then I should sacrifice my personal needs, and I should uh, do what is required by the society. And life had a higher purpose than just consume, consumption. Now all of these traditional values were overturned by surplus production because if you want to market your goods, then you have to make consumption the purpose of life. Otherwise, who will consume the so much? And simple lifestyle is not good because then you will, again you will not have consumers. Again, community is not a good thing for this purpose. For other reasons, social responsibility is not good because you need your labor force, they, they have to be exploited in order to create wealth. Uh, the colonization that took place of the globe, 85% of the globe was conquered, was uh, not just on the physical level, but it was also on the uh, conquest of knowledge. Now, all over the globe, we see the world through Western eyes. That's really the main thing. So, the Western ideas dominate. So, today the whole world is thinking about free trade and globalization and these are good things. And this is exactly what the process of colonization required. That uh, Previously, what self-sufficiency was a virtue, but now the theory of comparative advantage that we teach says that the colonies should specialize in raw materials and England should specialize in industrialization. So, the industries in India, they have to be destroyed. Instead, what we need to do is to send our cotton to England, then they should convert it into shirts, and they should, then they should bring it back to Pakistan for its state, or India, Pakistan. So this was the trade theory that we were taught, against which Gandhi said that we should wear other to prevent this. Uh, even though, <coughs> so actually the uh, cotton textile industry in India was more advanced than that of England at the time of the conquest. And these uh, industries were destroyed and actually the cotton weavers, their thumbs were cut off to prevent them from uh, uh, producing textiles so that ultimately then we became uh, dependent. So basically, at this time, if you read uh, the texts, then you will find that there are lots and lots of books, more than 100, which are talked about why the East is underdeveloped and why the West is overdeveloped. And for example, uh, some say that you know people in the East are lazy, uh, people uh, don't have the right culture, we don't have property rights, we have X, Y, Z. We have such and such mental disease, and they have all the good things, and these are the reasons. So, hundreds of books, with hundreds of theories. But what Stavrianos, in his book, Global Rift, says, in this book is now different, and hegemony is uh, the, the ways of knowledge, the ways that we have of seeing and looking at the world, uh, are given to us by the 
dominant discourse, the European knowledge. With this, uh, this uh, stuff, we have to say that it's very simple really. You want to ask why are we poor and why is your rich? They robbed us. So uh, millions of pounds of revenue was extracted from colonies all over the world. There was no money in India to invest to build industries. When people tried to build industries, they were shut down and closed. So obviously, we are poor. They took the money. They became rich. So two neighbors are living. One the person robs the other. The one who is robbed will become poor. The one who takes the money will become rich. So what's their need to write hundreds of books about this and explain that this is lazy and that is smart and so on. So basically <coughs> what we need to do is we need to learn. John Robinson said that we should learn economics to avoid being deceived by economists. And John Perkins has written a book called Confessions of an Economic Hitman in which he explains how he used economic analysis to deceive nations into taking loans which would actually <coughs> enslave them. So there is a book by the World Bank called The East Asian Miracle. This lists 10 strategies which the East Asian nations used to create advanced industrialization. East Asia is a miracle in the sense that these are the only societies which became industrialized in this period of time. Uh, moving from agrarian economies to an industrial economy. Uh, so how? So it lists the ten strategies that they use. After that, this book came out in uh, 1990s, and then the WTA was formed two years after this book came out. And anybody who signs the WTO signs on all of these ten strategies that we will not do that. So. Uh, you can understand uh, why WTO was created. They wanted, to, uh, they wanted to prevent more East Asian miracles. Similarly, there are many policies of the IMF which are known to be harmful, like austerity. You see, the standard gains theory, which we will discuss soon, says that if the economy is in recession, then you need to have large deficit spending. Uh, so, and, and this is what the European economies do. But in East, uh, in, in Asia, and all over the developing uh, countries, when they are in recession, the IMF gives them a loan and then says that we have to raise taxes and, and uh, cut government spending, which is guaranteed to make the economy worse. And it is known to do so. And even the IMF has acknowledged that it has harmful effects. So the question is why? The theory which is working in Europe is not applied and the reverse theory is applied. So there are many things which are hidden by economic theory. Modern economic theory is just a deception, it is a fraud. That is what I am teaching at Pai, by the way. So what I am going to do is to go through history very fast because we need to understand the history of how the modern world came to be. So, Basically, in the 19th century, there was a strong colonial system. Europe colonized the world, and there were um, each colony was more or less each, each area was more or less independent. The English trade system was within the pound area. The French had their own area, and there was not that much trade with each other. And the monetary system was standard central periphery style. There was a strong country, the hard currency sterling. And then in the colonies they had soft currencies which were not which were used only for domestic purposes, not usable for international trade. But as the uh, European prosperity grew, uh, because basically the system was to exploit all the resources, whether it's human or natural, for the production of wealth in the center. And uh, a few countries which were able to escape, like USA and Australia. Uh, because they were white, so they were not uh, oppressed as much and they were allowed to achieve independence. But the other countries tried and they failed. So there was an in increasing globalization as, as prosperity increased because of their rape of the world as it were, uh, utilizing all resources on the planet to create wealth for Europe. So uh, they became very 
Well, the NBA started trading with each other. So by the end of the 20th century, you had massive globalization. There was, you could, uh, uh, a person sitting in London could buy stock in South Africa and a person sitting in Berlin could invest in uh, American railroads. So there was a you know, complete, easy, free, quick transfer of currencies, capital from one burden of the world to the other. Now, the thing is that this level of international trade creates a dilemma for monetary policy. Uh, and this dilemma we will see later. Uh, and, but this dilemma was one of the causes of World War I. But I will explain that later. So basically World War I occurred because the whole world had been colonized. There was no more possibility for colonial expansion. So the history of Europe was always continuous warfare. The, actually, the idea of battle is so deeply ingrained into the European mind that you know you can read hundreds of novels. Whenever two alien civilizations meet, they start fighting each other. The idea that uh, two people can meet and be friends doesn't exist. I mean, you look at K.G. Wells, The War of Worlds, Martians come and what do they do? They start invading the planet. Why? Why can't you talk and, and communicate? This idea doesn't exist in the European lexicon. So for 19th century there was peace in Europe because they were out busy conquering the world. But after the world had been conquered, then they had nothing left to do. They started fighting each other again. That was the end of the colonial system. And so that led to the World War I. So, uh, there are more um, reasons, but I will skip over that. Now, I want to get to the... So, these are the broad facts that we want to think about. But, uh, now, we have to look deeper as you... The theory. So, one basic understanding is that, what is money? So, we will have to go deeper into that, but... For the moment, let's just start by understanding that money exists by law. It is not, uh, it is not gold and it is not uh, something valuable. Money exists only by what is called fiat, sovereign fiat, the law. When the government says that this is money, then it becomes money. So, as long as you have trade inside a colony that where the law holds, then uh, this is fine. But when you go to international trade, then you have a problem because your law does not extend outside your boundary. So, whatever system of international trade exists must uh, do so by consensus. It is an artificial system. There are no natural systems for trading across boundaries. So, uh, if we all agree that this will be the trading mechanism, then that becomes the trading mechanism. So, gold is a simple mechanism. So, I buy from France in pound sterling, they buy from France. At the end of the day, there is any imbalance, we settle it in gold. So, that's one way to run the system. It's a very simple mechanism. It's not a good mechanism, but it is a simple mechanism. So, in that, that is what, that is the system that came into being at the end of the 19th century and it lasted only for about 20 years or so. Uh, where uh, until the World War One, which caused a collapse in the gold system. The gold system is very simple. Every currency is denominated in gold and then um, when you trade with each other, you trade in terms of the gold content of that currency. Now, uh, the problem, this actually lecture was uh, developed from a lecture for economists. So, economists are brainwashed into thinking in certain ways which, so the problem is first that you have to undo that learning that you have done in economics in order to be able to understand the truths. So, one of the main things, uh, so this is, this is a quote from Keynes that difficulty lies not so much in developing new ideas as in escaping from old ones. If you have been brainwashed by economic theory then 
it is harder for you to understand what I am about to say. And if you are normal, then you will understand it very easily because the ideas that I am going to talk about are not difficult. But the economic planning makes them difficult to understand. So, the beginning of macroeconomics is to understand the nature of money. And the basic, very simple idea is that money is required for the economy to function. If the economy is functioning at the maximum, uh, then it needs a certain amount of money. So if you have less money than the needs of the economy, the economy will fall into recession. If you have more money than the needed by the economy, then the economy will go into inflation because there is too much money. So it will cause uh, things to be expensive. Uh, so uh, there is some uh, detail to this that it is not just the amount of money, it has to be in the right hands, in the right classes. But that we will ignore because that is a complication that uh, we do not have the time for in this short lecture. So what is the consequence of this simple Keynesian idea that you have to have exactly the right amount of money. Too much is bad because it leads to inflation. Too little is bad because it leads to recession. Now, in contrast to this, economists are taught that money is neutral. Money is a way. The quantity theory of money, which is famous and taught all over and believed widely, including at the state bank, which should know better, that uh, money does not matter in the economy. So, it is exactly the opposite of the truth. The money is all important, but according to what economists are taught, money is, does not matter. So this we can call the first illusion of macroeconomics. Uh, the health of the economy is actually crucially dependent on the correct quantity of money, but economics teaches the exactly the opposite. And that is why economists fail to predict the global financial crisis. Because their theories, the models being used currently don't have any money in them. Because according to economic theory, money doesn't matter for the economy. Now, one immediate consequence of this understanding is that gold we cannot use for money. And this is actually something which is still young people don't understand. And many people who look at the evils of the financial system, and there are many, they say, okay, the way to solve it is to go back to gold. But that is not correct because what happens is that gold is in a fixed quantity and it grows by the supply of gold. It doesn't match the needs of the economy. Now, as we understand from the Keynesian theory, the quantity of money must exactly match the needs of the economy. The economy is growing, the needs will grow. Money has to grow at exactly the right pace. It cannot go too fast and it cannot go too slow, otherwise it will have a bad effect. So, the gold cannot keep up to exactly the right pace. So, uh, what uh, now the, what the theory says, what the economic theory says, which is false, is that you see, the prices will adjust to make the quantity of money enough. And in some sense, theoretically it is possible. If we could adjust the prices quickly and flexibly, it would be possible to make the same amount of money work. But it doesn't happen. In the real world, prices are not that flexible. And that is why uh, this theory is just an illusion. The real world solution to the problem of gold currency is called fractional reserve banking. And this is a system which is currently working and it is a very bad system, but it does solve the basic problem. It solves the basic problem because in fractional reserve what happens is that you can print a lot of money and you can say, Amule Haza ko Kuman Adakariti Ekrupya, even though there is no gold behind it. And even, even in the, today, of course, this phrase is completely meaningless, but in the gold era, um, you can, every pound is backed by theoretically 100% gold, but actually the government doesn't have all the gold that is necessary to redeem all these promises. So, what that means is that you can print more money according to the needs of the economy, you are not bound by the gold. That is the, that is the key point that I am making here. That even though <coughs> technically you have a gold currency, you can expand the money to match the needs of the economy, which is necessary. So the fractional reserve system solves the problem of matching the money, but it does so by 
creating a fraud, a deception. So the government and banks, again this is something which economists, economics textbook don't teach, that not only the government but the banks can also create money. And what they do is they create what is called promissory notes. These notes promise that they will pay you something. Now only a fraction of these notes need to be backed by gold. All of them doesn't. Within a country actually no backing is required. If the government doesn't have any gold, it can still issue the currency. And it can just say that look, and the, the USA did that I, uh, you are not allowed to cash them in. So if you are a citizen, you are bound by the law, you can. But what about the foreign countries? They are not bound by your laws. So within the country there is no gold required, but across countries for international trade, there is some system that is needed. And gold is not the only system. In fact, gold is a very bad system. There are many other systems for international trade which have been cut off theoretically. But uh, they, are, they are suppressed because the current system gives huge amount of advantage to the USA. And the USA has blocked all change in many different international fora, which will create a more equitable system. Currently, the US is all powerful and nobody else has the same amount of power. And there are many systems, as I said, all systems are artificial. We can create many systems in which all countries will be symmetric. Everybody will have power and there was much attempt to create such system, but these attempts have been systematically blocked because the USA benefits a lot and it has the power to enforce its system on the rest of it. Now, <clears throat> as long as you only have to deal with the domestic economy, you can manage the monetary policy to be exactly right. But now when you are dealing with an international trade system, then you get into a dilemma. The dilemma is that sometimes, like happened at the most recent, I am a member of the Monetary Policy Committee by the way, and at the last decision we had a dilemma. Everybody acknowledged this dilemma. Either we can uh, have a tight monetary policy which is required by the uh, foreign trade to keep the exchange rate stable. Uh, this involves increasing the level of interest. Or we can have a loose monetary policy which is good for our domestic economy but harmful for the foreign exchange rates. So you can do only one of the two. You can either favor the domestic economy or you can favor the international trade. If you do, if you favor one, you will harm the other. So this is the dilemma. It's called a trilemma because there is a third angle which is uh, which is involved here. And you can do both. You can keep your exchange rate stable and you can support your domestic economy if you have what is called capital controls. You don't allow free exchange of dollars for rupee. So this is the third leg of the trilemma. It says that one of these three things you have to let go. Either you can have stable exchange rates or you can have a strong domestic economy or you can have free capital flow. You can't have all three of these. You can have any two of those. But you have to let go of the third thing. So well, the question is that when you have to choose, what should you prefer? Now, this so this is some economics. The second important point that we need to know about economics is that it is credit creation which leads to the business cycle. Economies, capitalist economies are always going up and down. They never go smoothly. So basically, understand why you understand Keynesian economics. And basically what we say is that if the economy is in recession, you should expand the money supply and you should run deficits and basically you should stimulate the economy to get it out of the depression. And if the economy is going very strong, then you should keep the money supply tight and otherwise uh, you will uh, run the economy into inflation and you will cause problems. So, this is called counter-cyclical policy. The business cycle is going one way, the money supply is going the opposite direction. <coughs> and so that is the correct economic uh, policy. <coughs> Actually, the system does exactly the opposite. When the economy is booming, then the banks 
create a lot of money because it is useful to give loans and the banks create money by giving loans. And similarly, the government also uh, runs an expansion in budget because they say, oh, there's plenty of money, we can invest, we can do this, that and the other. So this is called a growth signal. And when everything in the recession in the government tightens this budget that, okay, we can't raise too much taxes, so they cut deficits and so on. And similarly, the private sector also uh, reduces the money supply. And this actually <coughs> causes the business cycle to be even more severe than it would be. And this is the major problem with fractional reserve banking. This is how it works. And it doesn't work good. So that's why Lord Murray King, and this leads not only to small crises, it leads to big crises. Lord Murray, who is the governor of the Bank of England, says that of, of all the ways of organizing banking, the worst is the one we have today. Because it continuously causes crises. And basically the global financial crisis was caused by this, this kind of mechanism. <coughs> so, to, now as I said, we are studying the root causes. Which means that we are not going to be able to solve the symptoms because I don't have time to cover both. But we are thinking about the system as a whole. So, to understand, we, uh, the first thing to understand is that money is an artificial, it's a human invention. It's not a natural thing, like people think that gold is money. That's not true. Money comes into existence by fiat, it's created by the government as a legal tender, so it's a very advanced invention. It doesn't exist in primitive societies in the same way. Money is a way of quantifying debt, it basically converts a social obligation into a financial obligation. And uh, there is a very important book, uh, Graeber, David Graeber, The Debt, The First 5,000 Years, which explains in depth the meaning of money. And there are many other fat books about money. So we don't have really, uh, there's a dilemma about teaching money, that the reality of money is very hard and difficult, and I won't be able to get to that one. But the deeper truths about money are important. But we will just pass and we will look at the uh, uh, simpler, uh, more easily to understand level. So basically, before World War I, uh, you see, as long as the European <coughs> system was working, uh, most of the trade was within uh, a colony. Uh, a system like the British Empire and the French Empire, etc. So there was no problem with gold standard. But as the globalization increased, as trading increased, so then uh, this fractional reserve system uh, and the international trade system together, they could not work together. Because once you have large amounts of trade, then you, when you have trade imbalances, then you need to have that gold behind your currency. But the fractional reserve system says that you don't have the gold behind your currency. So now, as long as it's domestic trade, it doesn't matter. But in international trade, especially in growing international trade, the imbalances grow and then somebody says that, okay, look, I have so many dollars, please give me the gold. And now you're in trouble because you don't have that gold. So, um, this was one of the many causes of World War One. Now when World War I took place, because increasing globalization led to increasing trade imbalances and increasing imbalances in power, and this was very important also. So uh, in order to you know, prevent another country from becoming too powerful, uh, some countries decided to attack other countries and so on. So it's a complicated story, I don't want to get into that because that's not our main concern right now. But basically, as a result of war, all of the governments used up a lot of gold to finance enormous war expenses. So post-war, nobody had the gold backing. And um, the gold standard broke down as a result. Uh, so between the wars, after the World War I, gold was depleted. All of the countries tried to go back to this system of gold standard because it had produced a lot of prosperity. People were uh, fondly remembering that before the war we used to have such high standards of living 
Let's recreate that system. Let's go back to gold standard. But it could not be done. There was a lot of attempt that was made, and this attempt failed. And as a result, uh, a new system was created in 1944, which is right in the middle of the Second World War. Uh, and the Bretton Woods system said that okay, we will create par values for the currencies, and then the currencies will trade, and we will not actually use gold. We will. This is called the gold exchange standard. We will just say that. These currencies are de denominated in gold, and in emergencies and times of need, we can swap the currency for gold at the official value. But we hope that this will not be done, and IMF will prevent this from happening. It will give loans to whoever needs, so that the monetary system works without using gold too much. So we keep the economies balanced. So as a result of that, uh, basically. The world went on to a de facto dollar standard. The dollar was the strongest currency because USA did have gold, unlike the other countries. And the USA promised that I will keep my dollar backed by gold and I will honor uh, any one who comes and asks for dollars. So basically, the other countries said that okay, dollar is as good as gold, we will keep dollars instead of gold. So basically, dollar was uh, replaced the gold in the post Bretton Woods era. And then what happened was that in um, the Vietnam War, the USA used, printed huge amounts of dollars to finance the war, which was against the Bretton Woods Agreement. And then uh, when uh, there was a threat, actually De Gaulle threatened that they had lots of dollars, they said we were we going to cash them. So to prevent this from happening, Nixon said that okay, we are no longer going to get back the dollar by gold. So from 71 onward, the world went on to a floating currency system. So these are just the bare outlines of historical facts. There's lots of complications. But one, uh, so one, one of the changes was this floating currency. The second change was transition from industrial uh, capitalism so capitalism was based on building surplus goods, manufacturing them and selling them. Now, in the 70s, uh, the capitalism changed to a system which was about creation of money, not about creation of goods. So this was financial capitalism, which is the system we are currently living in. Now, the strange thing which nobody knows is that money can be created without any... any um, any consequence. The US can print trillions of dollars. So today the system is most amazing that the US has the, uh, has the gold manufacturing abilities. They can print dollars and they can buy oil and all the world and they can buy governments and they can buy armies and they can buy weapons, everything. They just have to pay it with paper. And all the whole world accepts the system. So financial capitalism is about the control of money and we are at the receiving end of the system and nobody understands the system in our policy makers, otherwise uh, uh, there are ways to avoid the damage. So in the British colonial era, millions of pounds of revenues were transferred from the Palmies to the UK and the Balinese became impoverished. Uh, they had repeated famines. There was no investment, no industrialization. Now, if you look at the post-war era when the freedom was gained, then the development is directly proportional to the amount of sovereignty exercised by the Balinese. To the extent that they were able to conduct independent policies, they were able to develop. Uh, the East Asian miracle <coughs> happened because of the Cold War. The Russia and the USA were fighting each other, so there was a room for people to develop independently of the umbrella of, of these two. As the, the countries which remained aligned with one country were basically ruled by a as a colonial country and uh, they were not able to develop. In this growth trajectory, the coconut class plays a very, very important role. Either their allegiance is to the foreign exploiters, in which case they will exploit their own country for the benefit of themselves, 
and the foreign countries or they will throw in their lot with their people and then the people can develop. Just like the colonizers had the, did not have any intention of developing India, they had the intention of extracting revenue. So if the government is about extracting revenue from the people, then it will not lead to development. If the government is about serving the people, then it will lead to the development. Now, the mindset that we have all inherited in the bureaucracy is the mindset of the rulers of the country. We are the rulers of the country. Everybody, if you ask their service, what is the thing that you would like your child to be? I want him to be a government servant. This is the biggest thing because those are the rulers of the country. So, you are actually the rulers of the country. Now, you have the choice. You can be the servant of the people or you can be the king of the people. So, the Lord Macaulay minute of education, I think everybody must have seen this, that the educational system of India was designed to form a class who would be the interpreters, they would be the intermediate. You see, there is the 1%, the real rulers, then there is the 9%, which are the intermediaries who rule on behalf of the elite. They get a lot of privileges and they get uh, good uh, pay and status in return for betraying their own people, selling out their own people. So these are the people that were created by Macaulay and this system is going on exactly as it was before the colonial times. Our people in Beacon House, our people in Lums, they identify with the, and there was an uh, incident in Lums where they said, okay, let's go out and watch the dance of the natives. So who are the natives? <laughs> the local people are natives and they are of course the coconut class. They are, they are the rulers, they are the natives. The, the rulers of Pakistan, they have a different lifestyle, they have a different mecca, they, they have different language. Their dogs and cats receive better health treatment than the children of Pakistan. But they, they, they are living in a different nation from Pakistan. So they are English in taste, in opinions, in morals and in intellect. And you are actually part of that class. <laughs> so, uh, I am also part of that class. You shouldn't be identified with them. This is, I think, too cruel. So I, I will, I will uh, come to that. You are, uh, you are in that situation. Now, uh, there are various reasons why things are different, not the same. But you have the opportunity to be one of them. And you also have the opportunity to do something else, which did not exist at the time of the British. If you tried to be servant of the people at the time of the British, you would be just kicked out of the service. You would not be accepted. Today you have the chance, you have the choice. So financial capitalism works by printing dollars to buy everything. Everything is for sale in a world where lives are measured in terms of monetary value. So the idea that is implanted in the minds of my students and in all the population is that you are for sale, you are an object for sale. The average student says that once I have my degree, the, the vast majority, then I will be put on the market, people will bid for me and if a multinational bids for me and pays me in dollars, this is the greatest thing that a man could do, is to earn the salary in dollars and so my life is worth dollars. Now, uh, as long as this idea that we are uh, we are uh, uh, commodities in the labor market, we can be bought and sold, human lives, then uh, we are for sale. Now, the idea that Islam gave is that all of the gold in the world cannot buy one moment of my life. And the Sahaba showed and, and, and demonstrated this. So that is the idea that is needed to combat this poison that we are for sale, commodities for sale. So now we come to the how does the current system work? You see, in the industrial capital system, there were actually empires. Today the same empires are going on. Today, trillions of dollars in money is going from the poorest countries of the world to the richest countries every year. How does this happen? There is no... Uh, we don't have a uh, uh, Gora Sahab uh, in the president. See, today, so how it, well, the system works, now the financial capitalism system works in a different way. What they do is, 
they give us aid. This so-called aid is supposed to finance projects, which actually ends up in the pockets of the ruling class, whether it's the politicians or the army or the influential opinion makers, the journalists, the academia, they all are basically foreign agents. They receive their pay from the outside in terms of dollars and in return they carry out the agenda, sometimes knowingly, sometimes unknowingly. In the academia we are pushing and propagating and researching theories which are actually extremely harmful to Pakistan and we think sincerely that we are doing good for Pakistan, that we should advocate free trade, we should let our uh, industries collapse uh, if the foreigners have better because it's a business world, etc. All of these false ideas and theories are dominant. So, basically the system works by buying the 9% to enforce the agenda of the 1% <coughs> on the 90%. And this, involve, this includes very importantly, creating social change. Basically, the goal of the system is to turn the whole population of Pakistan, uh, human resource, natural resource, into uh, instruments for creating wealth. So, every woman of Pakistan must be working in the factory, every man of Pakistan must, every child of Pakistan must be working in the factory. All of us are similar in age, I think. And so, we know that 10 years ago, 20 years ago, after you came home, then you would go and visit the family. Today, nobody has time to visit anybody. All you have to do is, uh, you are working very hard and your, your children are going to uh, tuition school, with, uh, to normal school in the morning and tuition in the afternoon. Why? Because they want to learn mo earn money. Why are they going to earn money? Because they have to work in the factory and produce wealth for the multinationals. So, everybody has been turned into a machine. Uh, 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 a little part which works to create uh, wealth in return for you get something in their return. It's not that you are not getting anything, but you get the little part and they get the big part. And you are the 9%. There are lots of, the 90% are suffering like anything, but you don't care. You are, as long as my children go to vegan house and my children um, have their health care, then if the avowed is uh, dying of hunger, doesn't matter. So there is the cruel choice that faces us you and me, that either we live a comfortable life, we align our interests with the 1% or uh, we uh, don't send our children to be with us. We have a, uh, we, we are, either we are part of the ruling class or we can rebel against the system, we can be a servant of the people. Now actually, in response to what you said, this system is no longer as difficult. There is something which is called learned helplessness. So what they do is they put an animal inside a cage and they put electric shock on the door. So whenever the animal tries to open the door, it, it just gets shocked and it learns that I cannot open this door, this door. Now then they take the shock away, but the animal no longer tries to open the door. So today uh, we have the possibility of freedom. Today there is no electric shock. Today it's possible for us to serve the people and we will not start actually. And it will not happen. Our children will not lose the privileges. Although, Quran says very penetratingly that, that the shaitan scares you that if you try to serve the people, you will uh, die of hunger and starvation. But don't uh, be deceived by him. Trust in me. I am generous and I will provide for you. So, Allah Ta'ala gives you great reward. So, the choice is always healthy. So, this is the eternal eternal choice. This has been true from the beginning of time. آج پہ ہے تالے رقیب کو کیا یہ چار دن کی جدائی کو کوئی بات نہیں جو تجھ سے اہد وفا اس دوار رکھتے ہیں علاج گرد شلے میں بھا رکھتے ہیں یہ لاسٹ نمبر جو ہے وہ اپنی اپنی خود ریوارڈ ہے اس میں ہمیں جو کام ہے کرنے کا اس میں جو اللہ تعالیٰ نے ہمیں سکھلایا ہے 
بہت ٹھیک بات ہے اگر ہم خدمت کریں گے اس خیال سے کہ اور ہماری قدر کرے گی جن لوگوں کے لیے ہم کام کر رہے ہیں وہ ہمارے شکر کر تو وی ول فیل کیونکہ جس کے لیے ہم کام کریں گے وہ کبھی ہمیں شکر نہیں ادا کرے گا اور تو اگر ہم اللہ سے اللہ کے لیے کریں گے تب تو ہم یہ کر سکیں گے اگر ہم اس کو کر لیں گے کہ ہماری شہرت ہوگی نہیں یہ کچھ بھی نہیں ملے گا تو مگر جب آدمی اس کی نیت کرتا ہے کہ میں اپنے لیے کچھ بھی نہیں چاہتا اللہ تعالیٰ اس کے لیے ایسے خزانے کھولتے ہیں جو کہ جہاں سے وہ سوچ بھی نہیں سکتا وہاں سے دس از دا آج بھی وہی وہی بات چل رہی ہے جو ابراہیم علیہ السلام کہ آگ ہے اولاد ابراہیم ہے نمرود ہے کیا کسی کو پھر کسی کا امتحان مقصود ہے